Hello, everybody. Um, before I start, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying respects to the Gadigal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered today. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here today. Also paying my respects to your elders, past, present and emerging. So to give you guys a bit of a background on who I am, my name is Yasmin and I'm honoured to be your moderator for today. So to give a little bit of background on myself, I'm in my final year of aerospace engineering and neuroscience at the University of New South Wales. I'm currently serving as the vice chair of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, UNSW, and as a member of the Sydney Youth Advisory Council of the US Consulate General Sydney. And both of these organizations are partnering today to bring you this webinar. I'm also an engineering student ambassador for UNSW. I co-founded UNSW Hyperloop and competed in the SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition and previously interned at Arcon researching future transportation technologies and including space tra travel, um, as well as the ANU in virtual reality. I also aspire to become an astronaut and live on Mars. And so I'm extremely hyped to be on this panel today, this webinar today. So to give a bit of a background on the webinar, um, human space exploration, we're all super keen to hear about it. Uh, today is the 51st anniversary of Apollo 11, and that's the first time humanity stepped on the moon. Space exploration has been ever-changing since then. So before Apollo, we had Mercury and Gemini, and then after that, we had the Space Shuttle Skylab, the International Space Station, and now all of a sudden, we've been permanently in space for almost 20 years. We're entering some new times with Artemis, but also private space companies are becoming more involved in not only being people to the ISS, but also to the moon and then to Mars. And we'll be getting into that over this webinar, which aims to highlight the past, present and the future of human space exploration. So to give um, some information about the Learn at Lunch, which you are tuning into today, uh, before we shut down, the U.S. Consulate General Sydney held Learn at Lunches on various topics ranging from entrepreneurship to women's empowerment to political satire. And today is the fourth virtual Learn at Lunch. Um, some of you guys might be tuning in from the Ben Franklin Club, and that's a youth networking group of students and young people interested in U.S. politics and affairs, which is supported by the U.S. Consulate General Sydney. Um, I did mention today that uh, the U.S. Consulate General Sydney has been kind enough to partner with AIAA on this. So to give a bit of a background on the AIAA, um, we're an engineering society that fosters a community of for aerospace engineering students at the University of New South Wales. We also house two projects, Design, Build, Fly and Rocketry, that compete in competitions here and overseas. Okay, lots of talking, but we're nearly, we're nearly to the good bit. Um, just for some housekeeping, everyone is automatically put on mute and we'll be first going through some questions that were submitted previously by the audience, by you guys, the audience, for turning it over to you guys to ask questions live. Um, and if you want to ask a question live, uh, please raise your hand using the buttons below um, and we'll call on you. Or alternatively, you can type it into the chat box. So. Without further ado, I am honored to be introducing you to Dr. Mary Ellen Weber today. Dr. Weber, would you like to give an introduction on yourself? Sure. Um, let me just say it is just such an honor both to be here with the State Department and sharing my stories and my insights with everybody from Australia. Um, I've never been to your country and I'm hoping uh, that COVID will cooperate soon and, and I'll get a chance to, to uh, get a different view than I was able to get from space. But um, I am a engineer and a scientist by background. I was selected in 1992, actually with Andy Thomas, um, whom I think you all know very well. Uh, we were in the same class and I had the great privilege to fly twice on the space shuttle, um, including a mission, the uh, third construction flight for the International Space Station. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that um, just uh, sort of the evolution of, of where we've been and where we're going and some of the great opportunities that Yasmin and, and other young people will have the opportunity to do um, that I may be a little bit too old to do these days. At any rate, I first wanna kick off by talking about how we get into space because I find that this is a, 
um, something that most people really don't understand. Most people think that we go into space by going up high, that if I have a big rocket engine and I launch straight up very high above the earth that I would be in space. And while that might be technically true, um, it would be for a very, very brief time because that huge force of gravity would still be there and it would yank me down right back to earth. So we don't go to space by going up high. We go to space by going fast. Crazy, crazy, insanely fast. And you can think about it like this. I'm sure some of you have thrown a ball or kicked a ball in a straight line and you know it can start out in a straight line, but that force of gravity will pull it in a curve, in an arc back to earth. The faster you throw the ball, the longer it goes straight the shallower that curve gets. And so imagine that you could throw a ball or a spaceship or an astronaut so fast that the size of that curve while it was falling back to Earth was larger than the Earth. That's how we go into space. We're going so fast that we miss it. We miss the Earth instead of falling back onto it. So how fast do you have to go? Well, you have to go 17,500 miles per hour, 25 times the speed of sound. This is so fast that we go all the way around the world in just one and a half hours. And it's very unforgiving. In fact, when we want to come home, what we do is fire a little engine in the opposite direction to slow us down by just 1%. That's the difference between missing the Earth and actually slowing down just enough so that we dip into the atmosphere and re-enter. And the reason why I start off talking about that is you have to understand that that need for speed is what drives all the challenges and all the risks, virtually all of them, um, about going into space. I mean, think about it. You need to have crazy, crazy power and engines to get anything going that fast. Uh, when, when astronauts, when we go out to our launch pad, we get strapped into the vehicle hours before the actual launch while they're checking out everything. I mean, it is a bomb. With the space shuttle, um, even the rescue crews were three miles away because if something went wrong, it would be quite an amazing explosion. And they do happen. Um, all, all of the companies that are developing vehicles right now have had launch mishaps trying to get fast enough so that you can go all the way around the earth. And also things change very, very quickly. I mean, you start out going zero miles per hour and in a very short period of time with the space shuttle, it was eight and a half minutes, you're going that fast. And what that means is that if you have a problem, um, say on the shuttle, if we had lost an engine or two engines or three engines, what you do to try to save yourself, you have mere seconds. On the shuttle, we would have five seconds to figure out what went wrong, figure out what to do, agree on what to do, and to do it. I mean, think about that. One, two, three, four, five. That's it. You are either successful or you weren't, and you're not coming home. And that's really you know, what drives the need for astronauts to train for years at a time because you have to understand every wire, every nut, every bolt, the engine systems, the computer systems, everything about it. You have to not only have that knowledge, but you have to practice as a team. We have checklists that help guide us, but you know, there was a saying and it was there were only two ways that you could get in trouble with the checklist. The first way is if you didn't follow the checklist exactly to the letter. And that might be obvious. But the second way was if you did follow the checklist exactly to the letter. Because with the millions of components on your spacecraft, um, if one has a problem, well, that may affect, you know, if something else has a problem, if you blindly follow that checklist, it can kill you. And, um, you know, I remember my second flight, it was in the year 2000. It was at the dawn of reality TV, and uh, reality TV was very new, um, but uh, Discovery was doing a, actually it was A&E, was doing a special, following us around. Uh, we were the third construction flight to the space station. Nobody had been there for a year, 
and um, they must have been bored with trying to find something to do. So they were following us around as we were training. And I remember being in the simulator, strapped in, and our training team was off in the control room where they would put in the different malfunctions. And uh, sure enough, they put in a series of malfunctions. It didn't go well, and we all perished in our simulator. And that certainly is not a morale booster by any means. But what it meant was we had to dig in even further and we found a way to avoid that peril that brought us down in that simulation. You see, there was one wire that was shorted and there was no indication in the cockpit or anything like that. Um, but we came up with a way. We turned on the light above the pilot and if that overhead light went actually over the commander, if that overhead light went off at exactly the same time that our pilot could only speak to the ground and not speak to us on intercom. Then we knew that that particular wire failed and we knew that if we had subsequent malfunctions, we would have to deviate from those checklists to try to save ourselves. And that's, I just highlight that story because that's just one example of, of all the knowledge that is needed by not just the crew, but by ground control in order to try to come home safely for a mission. And so I talked about speed being the reason why space travel is so, um, is so challenging and so risky. So on my first flight, the odds of my not coming home as they presented it to me on a piece of paper was one in 100. Now, they had worked on the engines, our rocket engines a little bit between my first flight in 1995 and my second flight in 2000 and the odds were a little bit improved. They were one in 250. But you know, let me put those numbers into perspective for you. If airline traffic had the same failure rate back before the pandemic, when we were flying at uh, airplanes at the rate that we were back then, there would have been 1,000 airline crashes every single day. Every single day, 1,000 airline crashes. And you might say, well, that was back then. That was with the shuttle. That's with those, that, those old rocket engines. We're in a new age, right? It's, it's all new. Well, I have news for you. Um, the target loss of crew uh, statistic that all these commercial partners of NASA are, have to show is only one in 270. And that's just all theoretical. It's all on paper. Um, we are no more safe flying our vehicles than we were back then. Space is a very risky, dangerous business. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so I wanna talk about how you prepare to go into space. I've talked about all this knowledge that you need to have. Um, it, much of it is studying, like I said, it's engineering diagrams, it's understanding how the systems work, how the computers work, how the rocket engines work, how the navigation aids work, things like that, and then we practice. You fly jets because you have to be in these real-time environments where you're practicing your uh, crew coordination with other crew members, talking to air traffic control, things like that. Um, and the only really, I would say, physically demanding part for the training really comes in spacewalks. You see, when you go out in a spacesuit, you're going out into the vacuum of space and your spacesuit is inflated and you're, it's like in a balloon. On the ground, we have these big leg muscles that we use to maneuver ourselves around. But in space, your leg muscles are pretty useless. It's these tiny little arm muscles that you use to both control your tools, your tethers, and to maneuver yourself around. And so it's very physically demanding and physically exhausting. On my first flight, I was primary for a spacewalk, but that was only if something had broken uh, would I have gone outside. And I have to say, you never want something to break. Uh, it is a risky business, but there was one malfunction. Um, it was actually a certain antenna that, um, they envisioned that there could be a failure and the way to fix it so that you could bring it back inside so you could close up the doors and come home um, was through a spacewalk. And that one was pretty simple to do and I think everybody was kind of rooting for that. Ironically, there was one flight where that failure actually happened, but they had a planned spacewalk on that mission and so that didn't get anybody an extra spacewalk in the end. 
Um, now, I want to share with you just some slides. Um, I want to go back again a little bit in history, not too far back, sort of when I joined the program, and then I'll progress through where we've been and where we're going in the future. So if you give me a moment, I will share my screen. Now, this is a picture of my launch uh, from 1995, the Space Shuttle Discovery. Um, this brings back so many memories, not just because of my own personal memories, but I am extremely fond of this vehicle. In fact, that is the most capable, versatile vehicle ever developed by any country in one, one space shot. Um, if you see at the very tip of it, that's the whole crew compartment. It's about the size of a maybe two bathrooms or two large closets. There's sort of an upper deck and a lower deck. But all that space behind that, uh, that little pointy nose is all cargo space. So not only could we carry seven crew members, we could also carry 50,000 pounds to orbit. We could bring up a laboratory along with the supplies that we could do experiments for more than two weeks at a time. We could bring up satellites. On my first flight, we deployed a satellite. Um, nothing that is being developed right now can bring up a crew and that amount of cargo. Nothing that's in development. The other thing that's really interesting about this vehicle, you'll see that um, there's a big orange tank. Um, that tank control contained liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and that was the fuel that we used to get us going 17,500 miles per hour. And at the base of the sh space shuttle itself, you'll see that there are three little blue jet plumes coming out of the back of it. Those were three magnificent engines um, that burned that hydrogen and oxygen. Um, but even all of that, oh, and let me just say, um, nothing that's been developed to date is more elegant, more efficient, or more powerful than those engines. And even though the space shuttle is not flying anymore, as NASA is developing its next vehicle to take us onto, onto the moon and, and one day onto Mars, we have, NASA has resurrected those very same engines just because they are so powerful, so elegant, and so efficient. But even those engines were not enough to get us going that fast. And so you see these two white things strapped, well, you only see one in this picture, strapped to that orange gas tank, if you will. Those are solid rockets. Those solid rockets are called that because the fuel is solid. The trick about solid rockets is that once you light them, there's no way to shut them off. So once those three engines on the shuttle lit and once those solid rockets lit, you knew you were going up into space. And even if you had a problem a mere second after the launch pad, you had to take that bomb with you, use up that fuel, get rid of it before you could try a landing back on the Earth's surface. There really was no abort um, capability that would take the crew away from that uh, very powerful explosive rocket set of engines. Um, now, Let's see. Um, but even then, throughout the shuttle, it wasn't just a matter of having, um, you know, the shuttle was flying from the early 1980s up until 2011. And throughout all that time, even though this system was originally designed um, in the Apollo days and, and, uh, and you know, put into service, like I said, in the early 80s, we were constantly upgrading. This is a view from my second flight, and this is the new spacecraft for the new millennium. Uh, we launched in 2000. This is a glass cockpit. Um, the, the main computers on the space shuttle at the time were only 256K of memory. Um, most of you can't even fathom, I mean, your watch has by far uh, 10 and 100 orders of, uh, 10 orders of magnitude more memory than those shuttle computers had. We had reel-to-reel -reel tapes that would enable us to go from one launch phase set of programs to the next. And only in 2000 did we 
overlay a different set of computers on top of that so that we could not just interpret raw numbers from very cryptic screens, but we could actually get information presented us to us on more modern screens. And so this was the new, uh, the new vehicle for the new millennium, but it only flew about 10 years before it was um, uh, put aside to develop something even grander. Now, um, that was the front looking towards the front of the space shuttle. This is looking at the back of the space shuttle. You'll see that there are, there's a lot of Velcro. Um, you'll see that I'm hanging on. Um, it's not so that I won't fall over, it's so that I won't float away. Of course, once we're in free fall around the planet, there is zero gravity. Um, but you'll see all these switches and things like that. The space station, on the other hand, has very, very few switches. It is controlled almost virtually all by laptops. Now, so we, we flew the shuttle from the early 80s until the late 90s when we first began the construction of the International Space Station. But I do want to point out something to everybody. This is a view actually on the left side of that screen is a view that we saw when we were rendezvousing with the space station. Nobody had been there for a year. It was like something out of a science fiction movie, being able to dock with an empty spacecraft and open up the hatch and hope that nobody, was, nobody had uh, taken residence on, uh, on our spacecraft. Up in the upper right is, I think that's a relatively, I think that's the current configure of the space station, or maybe it's a year old, something like that. But it is now larger than the size of a football field. It's absolutely huge. But I do want to point out something. Um, before the International Space Station, uh, we had something called um, Space Station Freedom that we were, uh, that we were designing at NASA. We had spent years and years, about a decade designing. We were ready to start building hardware. And NASA and the United States administration realized something. We realized that this was an endeavor that was bigger than any one country could handle. Um, if we really wanted to create a spacefaring civilization, we had to tap into the brightest minds, the most innovative people, and different cultures, different perspectives from all over the world. And so we scrapped that entire plan. And let me tell you, it was not, it was not an easy decision. There were people, I came on board right in the middle of the design of Space Station Freedom, but there had been people that had already spent a decade of their life, their blood, their sweat, their tears, um, trying to make Space Station Freedom a reality. And to start from scratch was very, very difficult. But I think it's the right thing to do. The International Space Station is truly international. Do you know at any one time, there's usually only one, even though we, uh, the United States are, are the biggest um, contributor to the funds and, and uh, hardware that make up the International Space Station, there's only one US astronaut, sometimes two, Occasionally, there will be three, but usually just one U.S. astronaut. And the other astronauts and cosmonauts are from different countries all over the world. And I know in Australia, you've had some very big changes creating uh, your own space agency. And um, I, I, um, I'm looking forward to even more uh, Australian-born astronauts than my classmate Andy Thomas in the near future. Um, let me go back and so what else, what other developments? Once we decided to end the space shuttle program, it was very hard. Um, the space shuttle had a lot of life left in her. Um, there was a lot more, as I said, it's one of the most cap the most capable and versatile spacecraft ever built and ever flown. Um, and yet NASA knew that we didn't need to just tap into uh, international, the best minds and most innovative minds, but we needed to reach out to the private sector. Um, most people envision companies like SpaceX or Northrop Grumman um, or, or even Boeing and some of these other 
uh, countries or, or companies that are building spacecraft as competitors of NASA. But you have to understand this was a decision by NASA to fund these companies. NASA has paid billions of dollars to these companies so that they could develop rockets in their own way with their own technologies, with their own ingenuity, so that then they would have their privately owned vehicles. And so for cargo, there's just a listing of the different cargo uh, spacecraft that were developed after we started flying 24 hours a day with a human presence on the International Space Station. Um, and since we ended the space shuttle program, Soyuz has been the only game in town for bringing astronauts and cosmonauts up to the space station. But um, just recently, as you know, SpaceX launched their first uh, crew. Uh, there, those two are on the space station right now. Boeing had a little bit of a hiccup. Um, you know, both SpaceX and Boeing were supposed to be uh, ferrying astronauts to the station back in 2017. And so uh, SpaceX is three years late. Uh, Boeing had its hiccup and they need to do another test flight before they will put crew members on that spacecraft. But we're hoping within a year or so, we will be no longer dependent uh, solely on Russia for bringing um, space travelers to the ISS. Now, it's not just about low Earth orbit and the International Space Station and our commercial partners that are just bringing, just bringing cargo to the space station and hopefully crew, crew members to the space station. But when NASA made that decision to invest in the commercial companies, they also shut down the shuttle so that they could develop a vehicle that could take us beyond Earth orbit. You know, I talked about the risk of going into space. You know, why would anybody take that kind of risk? It really is crazy risky. And, you know, for me, it was really about the honor of, of playing a part in creating a spacefaring civilization. I want to believe in this vision of us being on other bodies in our solar system. I want to, I want, I believe in that dream. And for me, that was why I took the risk. And so just going to the International Space Station, as amazing as that accomplishment is, um, we need to look beyond low Earth orbit. And so what NASA decided to do was to develop a vehicle that could take us beyond low Earth orbit. And NASA needs to work on its naming of its uh, spacecraft. I mean, you have the shuttle and you have the space launch system, which you see on the right, the SLS. Um, but that is a vehicle that is going to take us to a place no man has gone before, or woman. Um, you'll see they look very similar. Uh, that's a picture of my first launch on the shuttle Discovery. It has the orange tank, the two solid rockets, those three engines. And you'll look to the right, and that's NASA's new vehicle. But interestingly, you'll see that um, it has very similar solid rockets. In fact, they're the same solid rockets, but bigger. Now, that does present some engineering challenges, but they didn't start from scratch. Those engines, those four engines on the bottom, like I told you, are actually legacy from the shuttle era. Um, there's no longer vehicle strapped to the side. Um, eventually, we believe, you know, if you look at what caused our loss of Columbia and Challenger, it really was due to the fact that you had the, the spacecraft strapped to the side and not on top, where many people think that's where God intends crew members to be on top of the spacecraft. Um, but even though um, we're only launching this very small crew compartment at the very top of it, you'll see everything is much bigger because it has to take us farther than the space shuttle um, launch vehicle was ever able to take that space shuttle. And so where are we going with this SLS? Well, that's very exciting. Just this year, the United States announced its new Artemis program. Artemis is in Greek mythology, the twin sister of um, the god Apollo. And that's why uh, NASA chose the name Artemis because we're going to return a man to the moon and bring the first woman to the moon with a target date of 2024, which, oh my goodness, that is just four years away, my goodness. Um, and what you'll see, it's very interesting. You might say, well, we've been to the moon before. Why do we need to go back? But if you see, you have all these lines. These are trajectories that show 
the vehicle getting to the moon. But ultimately, we are going to park a gateway there in a, a very special orbit that will allow us to change its inclination, its axis, that it's rotating around the moon. We will be able to do um, both with and without crews, science and um, on, in orbit around the moon, as well as landing on the moon. And this is a, a picture of the gateway um, on your left and on your right is actually the Orion space capsule. It's being built by Lockheed Martin. This is technology owned by NASA. Unlike its commercial partners, NASA owns the Orion technology and uh, the spacecrafts themselves. And so that vehicle will go to the moon and we will have that gateway parked around the moon. And in fact, NASA just uh, has funded, just selected uh, uh, a few companies to come up with technologies to make a human landing system for the moon in 2024. Dynetics is the prime contractor building, and this is an artist's conception of that lander that will take uh, humans to the moon. The key to all of this is reusability. It's not like a one shot there, bring them back and then start again with another mission. It's all about putting hardware on the moon, keeping some hardware on the moon, having hardware around the moon and on the moon that can be refueled and making it a place where we can have a permanent presence, much like we've done with the International Space Station since um, late 2000. And, you know, I started out Yasmin and, and so many young people that are watching today. This is your future. This is what you have the opportunity to do. Um, I, I'm um, as, as amazing as my experiences have been to fly twice into space and to help construct the International Space Station. Um, uh, it's, I'm envious of all of you and what you will be able to do. Um, Mars, that's where everybody really wants to go, including NASA. But here's a reality. There are technologies, there are challenges we don't know how to meet yet. Um, much of the reason why SpaceX or Northrop Grumman or Boeing or uh, Sierra Nevada or different countries um, are able to rapidly build a new spacecraft, even to take humans into space, um, it's because they're engineering problems. We kind of have solved the main problems and now it's, 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 it's a really an engineering exercise. When you talk about trying to get to Mars, which is so much further than anybody can imagine, it is at, at, with the technology we have today, at best, at, at the earliest, it will take you nine months to get there. Um, what you see there is an artist's conception of laser communication. Um, so that we can do fast communications with any spacecraft that's on its way to Mars so that we don't have the huge time delays so that we can do this safely. We don't know how to go through an entry, a descent, a super a hypersonic um, with the weight of a vehicle that would carry humans through that very thin atmosphere. We don't know how to land people yet on Mars. I mean, these are just some of the examples of problems that are yet to be solved before we're successfully going to take people to Mars. I think we'll get there in the 2030s, maybe the 2040s. And again, Yasmin and all of you young people, uh, the progress of spacecraft development, of space technology development is accelerating so fast that this is all in your lifetime, on your horizon, and it's all possible for all of you. Um, I wanna talk, this is the last little slide I just wanna share really quickly, um, space tourism. There's a lot of talk about it. I personally think that the risks that I mentioned that I discussed at the very beginning um, really hasn't hit home with most people. I think that is the biggest hurdle because we are going to lose crew members. We're going to lose tourists, we're gonna lose crew members on these vehicles. And um, it's really important to understand those risks and have a good enough reason to take those risks. Um, and maybe, maybe those tourists will be like me. Maybe they see it as a way to move human civilization one step further and it's worth those kinds of risks. But if it's simply a joyride, I 
you know, I think, I think there are some better ways to get some thrills. Um, you know, I know as a NASA astronaut, I talked to you about the risk that was involved in going on the shuttle and going into space. But, you know, you spend a lot of time trying to think about how you're going to make this mission successful. You have the weight of your space agency on your shoulder, you have your crewmates, you have people who have devoted their lives to the mission, you have your country's hopes and dreams riding on your shoulders. But at the same time you're preparing for a successful mission, you're also preparing not to come home. Um, you know, every NASA astronaut designates a crew member and a, a crew office who is your family's point of contact. You designate the people that will be whisked away um, on launch if it doesn't go well. Uh, you have a little barbecue a few days before launch so that you can bring five of your closest family or friends. Um, it's really a time to say goodbye. And you know what's funny? Do you know that NASA's life insurance actually excludes space flight? from its policy. And so that's one of the things you have to do is you, they set up a meeting for you with Lloyd's of London so you can decide whether or not to buy your space flight insurance for your family. Um, I don't know if all of those realities are hitting home with these, uh, these tourism opportunities that are going to present themselves. Um, I, I do know, I, I, think, I think people are aware of these risks and they accept those risks, I think it will be amazing opportunity for so many people. And with that, I would um, love to answer some questions about whatever it is you would like to talk about. Okay, amazing. Um, definitely hit home there, just sitting here like, oh, wow, well, am I ready to die for this? But I think I am. Um, okay, so to kick off, um, if you guys have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and I can get to them, but for some pre-submitted questions. Okay. Um, since we're talking, I guess, in a future context, uh, as someone who wants to become an astronaut in the future, what is the most useful experience to get during university? And I guess stemming from that, um, what kind of non-academic skills also can you acquire, especially during these coronavirus times? Well, I, a technical background is very important because you really do have to understand and you have to be able to fix and repair and, and really understand your spacecraft. And so I'm not sure what all the requirements are in the different, uh, different nations that have space programs where they've um, selected astronauts that are in training. I know in the United States, everybody must have a technical degree. Um, but really it's all about uh, skills that demonstrate that you can be successful um, and that you can work with other people. They call it a very, they look for operational experience. They look for people that have been involved in whether it's expeditions, um, uh, you know, to, to the Antarctic, to the ocean. Um, I was, I was, and even to this day, I'm a very avid skydiver, for instance. Um, if you have experience on a, um, you know, a water vessel or an aircraft or something, um, those things demonstrate that you have had that operational experience. And also you want to be very successful at whatever you've done. Um, NASA or any space agency is taking a leap of faith by choosing you and hope investing a lot of time and effort and money um, to make you successful. Um, and they want you to be successful. And you know, a predictor of success is if somebody has done many different things and they've excelled in all of those different things, those people are probably likely to be successful in this new endeavor of being an astronaut and going into space. Um, and so team sports, operational environments, and simply choosing diverse activities and just putting your heart and soul into them and being successful and being able and willing to take risks um, and showing that you're willing to take those risks. I think those are the things that are most important. And so even during a pandemic, you can choose to um, do something really difficult and excel at it, even if it's from your own home. Yeah, okay, I definitely agree. Um, picking up maybe a, a hobby, I'm assuming. Yeah, things like that. Um, you did touch upon you're basically riding on a bomb. You have a barbecue before you head off to space. How would you suggest 
reassuring a national emotionally driven family about this launch safety before an orbital launch? What do you tell your family? You know, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, you know, for me, and I think it's true, at least for my NASA colleagues um, that were in the astronaut office with me, the crew office, um, I think we, we all knew the risks. And I think the families um, knew how important it was to each one of us. And they knew the risks were there. I know personally, it, it was funny. I remember my second space flight, we had, um, we had just bought a house. We were undergoing this remodel and we had all these things that we were, that were up in the air because nothing ever gets done as quickly as you would like. And we were sitting on the beach in uh, Cocoa Beach in Florida at this little beach house that NASA owns um, the day before launch. And we were talking about all the things we had coming up once I returned from space, both with our remodel and we had some vacations planned and things. And and I, it just hit me, and I, I remember saying, boy, it's really, it's really going to suck if I don't come back. Uh, and uh, leaving my husband with, with all of these burdens and, and with none of those uh, fulfilled um, adventures we wanted to take. Um, but we, we talked about it, and, and it was really, it came down to let's just um, think of the best, hope for the best. And if it doesn't go that way, know that it was important enough that um, we both we we both accepted how important it was and it was worth it yeah okay definitely getting emotional on this side <laughs> um okay so we'll flip it back to your time in space um how has your time in space changed your perspective on life of planet earth what does it feel like looking at earth from space you know that is Certainly, uh, the launch is probably the most memorable just because you know everything that's going on for those eight and a half minutes and you are keenly focused on your job during that launch. Again, those five seconds loom very large. And um, so I think the launch is the most intense and memorable time for me. And then right after that is, of course, looking at the Earth. And, you know, I just... Um, uh, for those of you that have time after this program, I do have a 10 minute video from my uh, two missions that I've compiled that shows some images from space and things like that that I'll narrate. But I remember floating up from the mid deck, I was on the lower level on my first uh, flight for launch um, and I was on the upper deck, part of the flight crew for coming home on that first flight. But I remember getting out of my seat, floating up and it's instant weightlessness once those engines shut off and taking the covers down from the window. And there was the earth, this curve, this ball, it was this planet and nothing could prepare me for that. And you know, one of the most striking things for me is the edge of the atmosphere. It is so close to, the, to our earth. It is so thin and it glows ever so slightly. It is this glowing blanket like neon Leon lights just encasing the earth. And you could actually see meteorites going into the atmosphere below you. If you've ever seen a meteorite here, you see this three streak through the sky, and that's more or less about 50 miles above you. And here I was looking at these streaks going into this atmosphere uh, 200 miles below me. And that's why I really feel, felt disconnected. And I really saw the earth as a planet. And, and felt like I was an earthling. Um, I remember distinctly, um, there were some crazy civil wars and some really horrible things going on in certain parts of the world. And my crewmates and I, we talked about it after we land because we remember going over those islands. And again, you go all the way around the earth in one and a half hours and it's this very tranquil thing. And we were looking at how beautiful those islands were. And then we got back home, we read about the devastation and the turmoil that was going on below. And it just really struck me that we are all earthlings. We're all part of this planet. And seeing this ball in space with the sun, like a light just shining on it, seeing the Terminator where the daylight turns into night, it, that's what I think changed my perspective the most. Amazing. Okay. Um, with, I guess, uh, technology evolving and hopefully more people in space soon, what are you most optimistic about in terms of space exploration? Um, what am I most optimistic? What I'm most hopeful about 
is that we continue to invest in space. It is, it is a very, you know, when you look at investment into a normal company or a normal industry, the time horizon, you know, people want to make money within two, three, four, five years at the most. That's a long time horizon. And for us to truly become a spacefaring civilization, I mean, it started with the Mercury and Gemini shuttle. I mean, it's, it's decades and it's generations before we see these big leaps that take place. And it's very easy to lose focus for nations and humans to lose sight of the future, that it's important to continue to invest the resources to continue to move that ball forward. Um, so my hope is that we continue to make those investments. And you know, certainly with Australia's um, commitment to creating a space agency, I mean, that's just one example of it's happening all over the world. People are continuing to invest. And that is my hope, my hope that that continues because I do want to see us back on the moon. I do. I, Yasmin, I would love to see you. I would love to see your film of when you land on Mars. Me too. Trust me, me too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you did touch upon Australia and I guess the world as a as a whole can be working towards going to space. What areas do you think Australia and other countries um, can, what can they contribute to, to make this reality of a spacefaring uh, civilization um, be the reality? You know, Australia for a long time has been very important in communications um, with spacecraft and such, and has been a very important partner of the United States for decades. You know, it, it really is the technology. I started out talking about knowing every bolt and every wire and the technology. I talked about that there are technologies and challenges that are still out of reach for us if we wanna to go to Mars. And so you don't have to be flying in space. Um, you don't have to have astronauts to help develop those technologies that will solve those problems. And so even for countries that don't have a human space flight program, even at the moment, oh, they are in the game. They are in the game. And as a, as a world, as a civilization, we're counting on you. This is why NASA made that switch from space station freedom to the International Space Station, is that we recognize this need for minds all over the world. And um, it's the long haul. And you know, it's really funny. Um, a number of years ago, I was actually with the United States um, State Department on a program through India. And India didn't have a human space flight program. And I remember this young girl, um, you know, she said, I want to be an astronaut. How can I be an astronaut? And, and my story is this. I mean, I am the least likely person to have ever become an astronaut. And, and this is what I mean. When I was a little girl, I mean, girls were not allowed to be astronauts. You were not allowed to be a policeman. You were not allowed to be a fireman. You were not allowed to be many, many things. And I mean, it was forbidden. I mean, up until I was in college, it was not possible for a woman to be an astronaut. And on top of that, I mean, I did not come from an auspicious family. My, my father died when I was a year old. We didn't have any money. We didn't have the resources. Um, there was no door open to me to become an astronaut and to fly into space, zero. It was slammed shut. But my family, my mother, my teachers all knew the importance of education, the importance of striving and making yourself ready because you never know when that door will open up. You don't know. And imagine if I had said, well, that's it. I can't be an astronaut. I can't be, you know, uh, People want to be, to be either a teacher or a nurse when I was growing up. Um, I remember watching Neil Armstrong take the first step on the moon. And I, had, I talked with my colleagues about that moment and they remember it. And they got a space helmet for Christmas that year. And they didn't want to take it off and they knew they wanted to be an astronaut. I remember watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon and I remember my Christmas gift that year. It was a set of cardboard um, kitchen appliances so that I could play house in my bedroom. You know, and, and so there were all sorts of opportunities for me to not work really hard, to not think of new opportunities and try new things. And if that 
had been my attitude. Once that door had opened up, I would not have been able to walk through it. And so I brought up India. Well, now they have a human spaceflight program. And so doors are opening. And so what everybody needs to do is, you know, do the, strive, strive, pick things that are really hard. Um, I was in college and there was this little ad in the school newspaper for the Purdue Skydiving Club, which really consisted of one guy with a car that would drive out to the drop zone. And this was in the day where, you know, these are round parachutes, big reserve parachutes, you know, belly mounts, and, you know, you landed like a rock and you had big boots and everything and helmets. It's not like doing a tandem skydive today. And I asked some of my classmates if they wanted to do this. And five of them said yes. And I was the only one that showed up at the meeting place. And it changed my life because up until that moment, I never knew about the world of aviation. I, I, I just never knew. And my life would be so completely different. I skydive even to this day. I compete even to this day. My life would be so completely different if I had not looked for a new opportunity and been willing to try it. And, you know, really, that's what I would say to anybody who wants to be an astronaut, even if the door is shut to you just pretend like it will open up because that's the best you can do. And even if it doesn't, you will have an amazing life if you live it that way. Wow. Okay. I, I'm definitely sure everyone on this call is learning so much from Dr. Weber today. Um, we are coming into our last ish five ish five minutes. Um, so Peter asks in the Q and a, um, what do you see as being in highly demand in terms of jobs and skills in the future? Um, and what can he do now to prepare? Also, I guess branching out from there, Leo asked um, before, how late is too late for a career change to be an astronaut? You know, um, I really, um, there's a, um, Richard Bach wrote a book called Illusions um, that many years ago, um, has many really pithy sayings in it. But one of those is argue for your limitations and they are yours. Um, don't, it's never too late. It's never too late to try something new. If you tell yourself it's too late, yeah, it'll be too late. But, um, you know, if you ask John Glenn, who flew <laughs> his 70s for the second time, um, a classmate of Andy Thomas's and I um, uh, in 1992 was 42, I think, at the time. He was one of the older selectees to be an astronaut. Um, it's, you just never know. And if you, if you make an arbitrary decision that, well, it's too late for me, um, that is your loss. That is your loss. So, you know, again, I think the skills going forward, problem solving skills will always be in demand. They will always, always be in demand. And, you know, certainly engineering, math, science, technology, it's really not about the, the knowledge you get or the equations that you learn. It's really about how to identify a problem, how to approach a problem, and how to solve a problem. And so whether it's software or hardware or something like that, it all comes down to problem solving. And you know what? If you decide not to be an astronaut, you decide to be a journalist or an artist or um, you know, a, a business, um, you know, an entrepreneur, anything like that, all of those skills will help you there as well. So it's a win-win. Amazing. Um, also, I think I'll, this might be our last question, um, but you did touch upon the arts. Um, is there any music piece of art or film that reminds you most about your time in space? Um, the movie Gravity was extremely well done, and Andy Thomas was the consultant for that movie. Um, was extremely well done in terms of giving you a sense of what it's like to be there. Um, where it really breaks down is you kind of have to suspend belief in physics. Um, kind of got a lot of things wrong that are just really fanciful and, and not very realistic. But the sensation, it really represented very well what the sensation of being in space is like. Um, but, you know, make no mistake, you can't have your space station blow up and then go, oh, look, there's another space station. I'll use this can of hairspray to putter over there. Um, it just doesn't quite work that way. Um, but uh, I, I would say that's probably 
um, my top pick to answer that question. Okay, amazing. I think everybody will be writing that one down and might be tuning in to watch Gravity this afternoon. Um, but we are reaching 12 p.m. and I'm so sorry if we didn't get to get to your question um, before or now. Um, so if you have some time, Dr. Weber does have her extra video to show you if you're skiing if you can stick around. Um, but before that happens, um, because we are wrapping up now, I'd like to thank Dr. Mary Ellen Weber for joining us from the US and for sharing her incredible insights and knowledge of space, human space exploration. Um, I'd also like to thank you all for joining us and for everyone who asked questions. I'm definitely sure that we've all learned something here, um, whether now or also in the next 10 minutes. Um, and I'd also like to thank the consulate for hosting this and partnering with AIAA UNSW to celebrate Apollo 11. Um, but once again, um, I'd like to hand the reins over to you, Dr. Weber, to show your video if you do not mind. Okay. Let me get set up right here. Okay. Now. Let's see. Hang on one moment while I switch to my film. Try this again. Okay, my film keeps going away. Do you all see that? Do I have people on? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, let me just back it up for a moment here and um, what you'll see, this is my second space launch. I've already talked about the magnificent shuttle. Um, you see all the gas pouring out of the top. That is liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. And as it cools down, it obviously comes out as air. Um, and we get into, um, and this is pretty much true even today for even uh, commercial crew vehicles, you get suited up about three hours before launch. All of those suits um, need to be, um, they have helmets and gloves that will seal up. If you get a hole in your crew compartment, you need to be able to have enough air to make it back down through going through that whole um, profile of getting rid of your bomb with a problem. Now you're lying on your back, everybody there are chairs, but again, you're tilted on your back. So you've got a parachute, you've got your life raft, you've got oxygen bottles, um, you're pinned to the back. It's like a gorilla sitting on your chest. You're trying to breathe. Um, and uh, at the same time, that five seconds is always in your mind. You are staring at these very cryptic screens, making sure you know what your job is and what you need to be looking for. Let me just pause it. I want to make sure, is everybody seeing the video? Yes, we are. All right, good, good. I suddenly <laughs> had this terrible thought that I was talking to a blank screen here. No. Okay, so I told you that it took us eight and a half minutes to get going fast enough. After two minutes, um, we got rid of the solid rockets. And there's a little bit of a sigh of relief. But again, even at this point, if one of those three engines were to quit, we might have to do an emergency abort. It might be a U-turn to land back at Kennedy Space Center. It might have been just a um, going across the ocean to land in either Spain or Morocco. Um, but everybody is holding their breaths for another six and a half minutes. Right at the engine shut off, you are instantly weightless. One of the first things you do is get rid of that orange fuel tank. It is going 99% fast enough and that wasn't good enough. And it burned up and was never seen again. Now, um, this is a view from the back of the shuttle. So if you look towards the front, you see those two little rectangles. Those are the windows on the back of the crew compartment. And we're looking out in what we call the cargo bay. And that's where you might have 
a satellite or a laboratory or hardware for the space station, something stowed back there. It's kind of like the trunk of your car. The robotic arm built by Canada, um, this is on my second flight. I was the arm operator and I'm doing a checkout of it um, before we dock with the International Space Station. Um, now, um, as cool as it is to go 25 times the speed of sound, to actually match orbits with another vehicle also going 25 times the speed of sound is incredible. And the entire world has gotten very good at it. Um, there's that little dot of white just over the horizon. That is the space station. That's what we have to match orbits to. It's not like an airplane. You can't um, accelerate to something. If you accelerate, what you do is you actually change your orbit. So it really is a lot of math, a lot of calculations, a lot of computations that the computers and the engineers do in order to know exactly when to burn an engine so that on the other side of the world, your orbit will be changed in the right way so that you can be in a perfectly matched orbit. Now, um, the, uh, I told you how, oh, that is the docking mechanism that was sitting right outside those windows. That's what I was controlling throughout the rendezvous and docking. It had a camera that was looking up through it and it had those three little crosshairs that would grab onto the station once we um, um, came into contact with it. This is almost the entire upper deck. You can see how crowded it is. Everybody has a job. There's Yuri using the radar gun to measure our closing speed with the space station. That's the target on the bottom of the space station. And it looks like it's just floating there above us. But again, it's all about matching orbits. And here we do, we come together at mere um, a tenth of a foot per second. Uh, lots of congratulations. We had practiced this in simulators for hundreds of hours. Everybody's breathing a sigh of relief. That's the same view you saw before, except now there's a great big space station in the way. You know, one thing I didn't talk about is, you know, it's kind of fun to be weightless in space as you're in this free fall around this planet, but it's also very annoying. Um, one of those reasons is, of course, bad hair days. Um, but everything just gets lost. Even to do something like control the arm, it looks like we're standing there, but of course we're not. There's no gravity. We would float around. We have our, foots, our feet in these foot loops, um, these basically loops on the floor that we sort of control our pivot on them. Um, we have checklists that are floating around that you have to get to the right page. Um, so it's, it's, everything's a little bit tricky when you're doing it. You know, what's very simple on the ground with the help of gravity, not so much up there. Now, here we are, we're on this after we've rendezvoused with the space station, and I am maneuvering some of the two of my crew members around the space station on the end of that robotic arm that you see there. We brought up thousands of pounds of equipment, um, and you can see just how close the space station was to our windows. There are the windows out the back you saw before, and there are also these overhead windows. Now I had the chance to actually on my first flights put my sleeping bag right underneath those overhead windows. And you had to have sunshades because again, you have, you're going around the earth every hour and a half. So you have 45 minutes of light, 45 minutes of dark, 45 minutes of light, 45 minutes of dark. Without the sunshades, it would be very, very difficult to sleep. That's a view from the elbow of the camera. Um, with the space station blocking my view, this was one of the first flights where the arm operator, where I didn't have a clear view of your arm at all time, and at all times. And so we had to come up with new um, ways of changing our points of reference and virtual views and camera views to enable me to make sure that I didn't bang into anything. Um, you know, that, that is not really something you want to be remembered for. Now, here at the end of this spacewalk, they've been out there for six hours and Scott is opening up the space hatch. Now, that space hatch went to a number of different places. If you closed off hatches on either side, you could make a airlock out of it and you could do a spacewalk from it. Or if you opened up some different hatches, you could go down a long tunnel and in the back was basically a room addition. It's called the Space Hab, and it was a compartment where we stored thousands of pounds of equipment that we were installing inside the space station that we were bringing up. You'll see how everything is strapped down and tethered down. Um, if it's not, it gets lost. Do you know that on the space station, they are finding things that have been lost seven years ago? 
uh, everything floats away and it's amazing the nooks and crannies it can get into. Now, here you go, if you go back down the shuttle, you could go into the station itself. There were only two rooms, two modules there at the time. The first was a node. It was big enough where you could actually get trapped in the middle of it, or I was short enough that I could get trapped. But there are hatches all the way around, and um, there, the idea was to have a module attached to each one of those hatches in the future while we grew the space station. And of course, there are modules um, attached to all of those hatches, and there are multiple nodes. And there is even a plan for Axiom, a commercial company, to attach a module to the space station and one day create a commercial space station once NASA chooses to um, deorbit this space station and the other partner countries. Um, that was Susan and Yuri in the previous image. They were repairing some batteries. It became very critical that we got up there on that flight. Very, very critical because the batteries were failing and nobody was up there. And if you imagine how annoying it is to have your cell phone battery die, imagine if your space station battery dies. Um, so it became quite, um, quite tense um, as we were trying to get off the ground uh, due to some weather concerns. And we didn't get off until our fourth attempt. Here is Jeff. Um, he is actually controlling the space station from one of those laptops I told you about earlier. Now I want to take you back into the shuttle itself. Um, that's the upper deck again. Um, to get to the lower deck, there was a hole in the floor and you would just float through it. Off to the left there is the door to the bathroom. Right in front of it is the galley or our little kitchen. There's another view of it here. And it was a place that dispensed water. I'm putting my feet in those foot loops again while I try to get myself stable to put some dehydrated food and inject some water into it. There's a little oven there. Um, meals were really a time for us to get together, talk about what we'd accomplished um, and what we needed to accomplish still. We were very proud of that, by the way. Um, one of the interesting things about being in space is there is no ceiling, there's no floor. It is all in your mind. But one of the things that um, is really interesting is that you do have to pick one. And you could be floating in a, a compartment and decide that the floor is the ceiling and the ceiling is floor. And by golly, it looks like a completely, it's like you went into a different room when you make that mental switch. Exercise is really important up in space. I'll point out that this bike has no seat think about it, it just has a belt keeping me from floating away with my little Walkman floating in front of me. This is a drop of water that we're moving around on a piece of string. Gravity is what limits the size of raindrops here on Earth. It's a competition between surface tension and gravity. Up there, the only um, limit is you better not crash that glob of water into an electrical panel. Now, I told you about putting that seatbelt you saw, I mean, that uh, uh, sleeping bag underneath that overhead window. One morning, I uh, woke up, took this cover down, and this is what greeted me. This is the Nile River Delta going off the left side of the screen and just so blue, beautiful with that blue water and the desert. Grabbed the camera, started fil filming. One of the things that really struck me about looking at the Earth in space is that you can see the power in the Earth's plates as they move together. This is the Himalaya mountains that are formed because India is literally crashing into China and that is forming the Himalaya mountains. Um, I just, it's just breathtaking the power that you can see in the Earth's crust. Now this was Venus and Mars. It was rising before the sun every time we went around the world. Um, and we thought it was so beautiful to capture three planets all in one view with the sun coming up. Um, it was hard to capture it. Our cameras weren't very good back then and um, the light levels were changing so rapidly. But since we had 16 sunrises every single day, we eventually got it right. This is that what I was telling about earlier. This is the earth at night and you can see the edge of the earth and just above it is that thin, hazy, glowing edge of the atmosphere, the ionosphere, just blanketing the earth. The lightning, that, those flashes that you see, those are lightning storms connected over by thousands of miles. The points of light, I, really the cities are just like jewelry over the earth. Now we live on a great big magnet and it's a good thing that we do because that magnetic field keeps out deadly solar wind, which would kill us all. But at the edges of that magnet, the poles of the magnet, that solar wind can sneak in, ionize the gas like a neon light bulb and create the auroras. And I got to fly through an aurora on my second space flight. Um, 
Now, when it's time to come home, we set up seats. We had taken them down right after the engine shut off before. We get back into those seats, strap those seats. You can see that glass cockpit that I told you earlier, really a breathtaking view compared to my first flight. Now, when we re-enter, we're going 25 times the speed of sound. And as we hit the atmosphere, all that flashing, all that energy is from the friction that was created. Now the shuttle, I told you how magnificent it was, but it, it took off like a rocket, but it landed like an airplane. It's important to realize it is an airplane without en any engine. We had one and only one chance. We, we slow down on the other side of the world and we dip into the atmosphere and we have to land on this tiny little airstrip in Florida. If we didn't, it would not be survivable. We are like a brick with rings. We would dive down at the end of the runway. We wouldn't even begin to pull up till 2,000 feet. We weren't even slow enough to lower the gear till just mere seconds before landing. So, I mean, of all the things you need to worry about, is, are the wires connecting so that when I push gear down, will it actually come down? Because again, if without the gear, that landing is not survivable. Whenever I look at this view, um, it just brings back so many memories. To be, I talked to you about being one cog in this grand endeavor of creating a space civilization and having the honor to have this role in just one mission to help move that ball forward. And so at the end of a mission, you're relieved, you've made it back safely. Um, but I, I look at that and I remember sitting there thinking, I just cannot wait to share it with all my, my husband and my family and my friends. You know, I told you, um, certainly the best thing about being an astronaut is getting to fly in space and see the world from space. The second best thing is having the opportunity to share it. And so I just want to thank um, the State Department for hosting this and giving me the opportunity to share my experience with all of you in Australia. Um, and with that, let's see. Um, with that, um, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Weber, once again, uh, for joining us and for that amazing film. Um, I think we have reached the very end of our webinar today. So thank you once again for joining in, um, taking the time out of your day to to listen to Dr. Weber talk about her amazing journey in space and her amazing insights as well. Um, but with that, have a great day. Um, and thank you again. Bye-bye, good luck. <laughs>